Hey everybody, Christopher Odd here. Welcome back to Siberia. So, we most recently put our that voice cylinder and found out about Hans, finding out about these mammoth things, and just got a little bit of a backstory about Anna and Hans. Now, the only thing that I really have left to do is make the feet for, uh, for Oscar. So I'm going to go up here and see if we can't figure out this panel. Because there's got to be a way to get this this factory line going, or at least something. It looks like only this number three is working, and then we have uh, a bunch of these different options. So I'm thinking, okay, it it can't just be guesswork. But what in here could actually have some information? Maybe Anna's diary actually. Oops. Let's take a look through here. You know what, we're gonna- I'm actually- I haven't gone through this and I picked this up quite a while ago. I am gonna go through this diary now, maybe there'll be a hint in here, maybe not. But, this is going back to May 14th, 1930. Yesterday something terrible happened, I do not know who to turn to, who to talk to, so I've decided to write it down. You, dear diary, are now my confidant and sole guardian of my secret thoughts. Hans lies in the next room, teetering between life and death, and I am terrified. So she's writing this right after the, uh, the event that we just witnessed, where Hans fell from that rock in the cave. Oh, the injustice of life. First Mama, then Hans. Please, dear Lord, don't take my little brother away as well. Then the next day, Hans made me promise to keep this a secret, but its burden is too heavy. I know I can tell you, though, dear diary, we discovered a cave in the mountains, a marvelous cavern with ancient paintings on the walls. Only prehistoric man could have painted them because they were depictions of mammoths, which are prehistoric creatures as well. That much I know. I hate mammoths now. It's all because of them and because of that stupid prehistoric children's toy. Why hands? Oh, why did you try and take it? And why did I let you climb up there? It's my fault you are in a coma now. Hands, if you ever die... S sorry, hands, if you die, I do not know how I could ever forgive myself. This is the next day. Hans has still not regained consciousness. Father cannot sleep and Gertrude cries all day long. Outside the heat is suffocating, but inside the house is icy cold and dismal. I still have hope though. I know my brother. I know his strength. He will pull through. He never gives in. May 17th. I cannot think of anything else but Hans. In all my waking and sleeping dreams, I see his fall over and over. I see his head hitting the rock and his oh-so-pale face softening. I have taken refuge in the attic. It is the only place where I may find any peace wrapped up in all my memories. May 18th. Five days have passed since the accident and Hans has still not opened his eyes. To see him like this is unbearable. Please God, protect him. Take my life, not his. Next day. I feel so desperate, so alone. I want to snuggle up in father's arms, but I dare not. He's just so impassive. Oh Hans, don't leave me here. Next day. It has happened. Hans has come back to life. He opened his eyes and uttered my name. My name. Do you realize? This is the happiest day of my life. I want to take to the streets and sing to proclaim my joy to the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you, God. Two days later. How wonderful, how beautiful life is. Gertrude and I cannot stop breaking into uncontrollable fits of giggles. Hans even wolfed down his meal today. I knew he was tough, my little brother. Even father smiled at me today when he said good morning. Three days later. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I am totally absorbed in Hans' recovery. I have scarcely five minutes to myself to return to my refuge and scribble down these words. Five days later, this is the end of May. It is very curious whether Hans is hungry, thirsty, or if he wants something, he cannot stop saying my name. He can't bear it when I leave him, even for an instant. Gertrude thinks that I should move my bed into his room to help him sleep better. I hope that father will agree. A couple days later, today was the first day that Hans has left the house. We went for a short walk in the garden, but Hans is still very weak. The doctor said we should be patient and shouldn't rush him. It is so hard, though. I hope so much that life can return to how it once was. June 20th. Hans has now been out of his coma for a month. He still doesn't say very much and has difficulty moving. He sits motionless for long periods of time, his eyes wide open as though lost in thought. I have often had to call his name several times before he reacts. Then he will smile, and when he does, the moment is magic for me, and I couldn't possibly be happier. A couple days later. 
I had to talk to him. The burden was too great. I asked Hans about the accident at the cave to find out what he could remember. He could only utter one word. Mammoth. And his eyes glowed so strangely when he said, th when he said it that it frightened me. Now, skipping a few months, going to September here, I go back to school today and for the first time in my life I am dreading it. I am afraid of leaving Hans alone. Despite Gertrude's kindness and attention, I have the impression that Hans is much less nervous when I'm there. A month later, while I was doing my homework yesterday evening, Hans crept up on me so quietly he made me jump. He took a pencil and a blank sheet of paper and curiously he started drawing. It's the first time since his accident he has done anything but daydream. What the hell? Eight days later, Hans scribbles almost obsessively. It's almost all he will do all day long. I feel it annoys father. Nobody ever understands, but I can see that Hans is trying to draw mammoths. This is now in November. Today is my birthday and Gertrude has made me an apple pie, my favorite. But father has not returned home for lunch and Hans doesn't want to leave his room. The best present I could ever have is to see Hans back on the way to recovery. Now this is Christmas day. Snow is falling, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Now the next year. The doctor visited to examine Hans. He seems happy that my little brother has fully recovered his faculties. It truly is a miracle. I don't understand why he doesn't talk more though. Why isn't he livelier like he was before? A month later. It is Hans' birthday. Today he is 11 years old. I have the strangest of impressions that actually he has lost 5 years rather than gained one more. Interesting. The doctor has just left. I saw him whispering with father. Their serious expressions worried me awfully. What could they be hiding from me? I'm growing up now. At the age of 15, you can understand everything. I am too scared to ask father what is happening. One month later. I have been thinking and it seems to me that Han's attitude isn't normal. The shock of the fall in his coma must have had much more serious effects than we first imagined. Hans, my dear brother, what is happening to you? Another month later. I've discovered the truth. Hans is stunted, physically and mentally. I eavesdropped a conversation between the doctor, father, and Gertrude. Gertrude buried her tear-filled eyes in her apron, and father muttered the word retard under his breath. How could he say such a thing? A few days later. It is Easter, and we're on school holidays. This means I can spend all day with Hans and protect him from father's permanent dark moods. He cannot accept the fact that Hans, his only son, will stay in this state forever. April 14th. It is truly difficult to accept, but it is not Hans' fault. Mine, maybe, but not Hans. I don't know how to make Father understand. He seems full of hatred for him. It's dreadful. I feel so powerless. May 14th. One year. One year has gone by, and it feels like an eternity. The situation shows no signs of improvement, neither in terms of Hans' mental health or Father's attitude towards him. May 30th. Extraordinary. Father has decided to take Hans to Paris for new tests. He says that only in the French capital will he find truly competent doctors. We must make Hans ready for the great expedition. June 6th. No news from father and Hans, but I remain hopeful. I am sure they will take good care of my little brother. Now, this is a month and a half later, basically. They've returned. Hans rushed into my arms and started crying. It took me a long time to calm him down and get him to sleep. Father is still as taciturn as he was before he left. The French doctors have confirmed the diagnosis. Hans will remain physically and mentally impaired. I am stunned. End of August. The summer is coming to a close. It has been less stifling than the last. The sun has put color in Hans's cheeks. When I look at him, I have difficulty imagining that he will not change. Middle of November. Father still says nothing and increasingly shuts himself away in his office in the factory. Christmas time. Gertrude tells me that the love and faith triumph over any science. I lack neither. God be praised. January 12th. Father took Hans to the factory this morning. Hans was so afraid that I accompanied him. Fortunately, Father said nothing. I failed to understand why he insisted on bringing him here. Next day, Father left for the factory with Hans once again this morning. I think he wants to persuade Hans that he could be useful for something. It is his way of resisting fate. A month later. For a month now, every morning Hans has gone to work with Father at the factory. I'm not exactly sure what he does there, but he seems to enjoy it. I feel my brother's behavior has changed considerably. He is much less capricious. April 14th. I could cry. Hans made me a present. A small robot mammoth with a trunk that rises and falls. When father saw it, he nodded his head in satisfaction. A month later, both Gertrude and father have now have their own robot mammoths. Theirs are even more intricate and finely tuned. Little brother is not such a retard after all. October 15th. Hans' mammoths now walk... 
uh, raise their trunks and wag their tails. It's incredible. December 22nd. <laughs> 22nd. I met the head of the factory workshop, Dr. Mr. Grips. Is that, what that, is that a G? This morning, uh, he says that for a young lad of 12, Hans is very gifted. It's a shame he only makes elephants. February 11th. Father and Hans were locked in a long discussion yesterday. Or should I say, Hans was locked in one of Father's long monologues. As it is inconceivable that Hans should go to school like other children, Father wants to take him on as a worker at the factory. However, Hans will have... Hans will have to stop making his own little devices. Hans' silence, his half-gaping mouth and staring eyes finally sent Father off in a rage. February 12th. I tried to broach the subject with Hans. I suggested he should obey Father. Learning a craft at the factory is his one chance to do something constructive with his life. He is so gifted and takes so much pleasure in making automatons. He did, n he did look like he wasn't listening to me. But I know he'll think about what I said. February 20th. It's not that Hans cannot speak, it's rather he doesn't want to speak. He uses the least possible words for communication, except with me, but he's still very economical with words. This so much reminds me of Momo, like it's, it's crazy how much it's, how similar they are. Uh, May 15th, 33, incredible, Hans was now, uh, was not just satisfied with learning how the assembly line works, instead he has completely redesigned it. Father and Monsieur Grips are taking a serious look at his plans. And I, I made a comment, like, way earlier that I think Momo might be Hans, but look, at like, Hans, this is in 33, right? And we're in, like, the 90s, so there's no way that Momo could be him, but still a lot of similarities. July 10th. Father has wanted to talk to me about my future since I passed my exams. He wants to send me to university because he says my intelligence is astounding. My heart was beating so loud. Is it true I do love studying, but I couldn't bear to be away from Hans? What a ghastly summer. This is September now. I've been permanently torn between my desire to go to university and my refusal to leave my brother. I talked about it with Hans, but he said nothing. That same evening, I found my own little mammoth broken. What? October 9th, Hans had another fit of hysterics at dinner again. Father announced that Hans' new assembly line would soon be finished. However, they have removed the automaton parrots that shout orders as they were deemed superfluous. Or superfluous. Hans was livid. He hurled his soup dish to the ground and stormed off to his bedroom. What will happen between the both of them when I'm not here? October 17th, despite my scruples, I am finally leaving. Hans has not talked to me for a week. Father would not understand if I told him why I wanted to stay. My heart is so heavy. Christmas. It is so strange to be home. I had never left home for such a long time before. Once we were alone, Hans did not stop talking. Words just leaped from his mouth. How he laughed at his excitement. He presented me with a delightful little ballerina to replace the mammoth, he told me. I was so touched that I started crying. Distance has done nothing to harm the strong bond between us. September 10th. Oh, did we go from... Oh, yeah. So he's skipping a long period of time here. Oh, here we go. Yeah. It's strange to pick up this diary once more. At first, my impulse was to tear it up, but I resisted and instead succumbed to my second desire, which was to write for a while. I'm alone in my attic once more. I've been home for two months now, and after a summer spent living with the intense joy of being reunited with my brother, Hans has returned to the factory. Father has aged so, and Gertrude's arthritis causes her terrible pain. September 13th. All in all, these last four years have been kind to Father and Hans. The relationship is less tense. They still do not exchange much conversation, but they now have a thing in common. The factory. I'm beginning to feel a bit jealous. Silly, really. Hans hasn't changed. To help Gertrude, he has designed a totally automated kitchen, and Gertrude can't stop moaning at the wooden puppets. Oh, how I adore them. October 9th. I went to work to see Father and Hans... I went to go and see Father and Hans at work. I hadn't been to the factory for ages. It is strange how much it has changed. I was very curious to see them set about their tasks. I like Father's new office very much. Hans has a small workshop on the first floor, crammed with odds and ends, unfinished robots and designs, exactly as I imagined it, in fact. October 15th. The factory is working very well. Orders for toys keep coming in spurred by the run-up to Christmas. When I was at university and I said my name was Vorlberg, people would ask me if I had any relation to the Valadolin factory. Now I know the effect that Hans' genius has had on the factory's renown. 
November 2nd. To make myself useful, I started helping Father set his papers in order. The most extraordinary thing of all is that for the first time ever, I have the impression that the three of us form a real family. December 8th. Hans never ceases to surprise me. Between home and the factory, his behavior is so very different. In his workshop, he is serious, concentrated, a proper young man who keeps his eye on everything going, going on, constantly on the move and in control. One has the impression that each single toy in his very own inf is his very own infant. At home, he turns back into a child once more and, either be and is either moody or a happy-go-lucky buffoon. Christmas. The most wonderful Christmas of my whole life. Hans and I could not stop giggling like children. Beneath father's disapproving glare... Uh, beneath father's disapproving glare. Gotcha. I know that he was only pretending, really. Our hearts are so full of hope. January 38. Hans came to see me in my bedroom yesterday evening. I felt terribly awkward, terribly ill at ease. I might have guessed. Hans wanted to leave. Leave Val de Laine. The house in the factory. He wants to go traveling. He just, he doesn't know where to or for how long. That's just like him. I was so shocked that I told him his plans were foolish. He left my room without a word, his head bowed. January 7th. I thought that he wanted to leave because of father. Not at all. It's because of the mammoths. He wants to go tracking mammoths. I thought he had gotten over his obsession. I know my brother only too well. I wouldn't dream of telling him his quest is useless. It, re it isn't worth it. He will not listen to reason. January 10th, 38. I was so selfish the other evening, I returned to talk to Hans and ask him gently if he was sure of his decision. I already know what the reply is going to be. Nothing will make him change his mind. January 19th, 38. Despite my profound sadness and despair, I must help Hans fulfill the destiny he has chosen and announce the news to Father. I fear the worst. January 24th. The worst was worth, worse than my fears. Father's anger was terrifying. He shut Hans away in the workshop at the factory and has forbidden all visits except from Gertrude, who feeds him. Six uh, days later. Father has decided that Hans should remain locked up for as long as it takes him to abandon his infantile decision. Gertrude tells me that Hans is very despondent, yet highly resolute. The worry is driving me mad. February 6th. As soon as Gertrude returns from the factory, I hasten to get news of my little brother. He doesn't say anything. He just fiddles with bits and pieces. She replies every day with a sigh. I have tried desperately to reason with father, but I know I am just wasting my breath. February 9th. Hans is 18 years old today, and he is all on his own for his birthday. February 20th. In secret, Gertrude delivered to me a small robot from Hans. It's a robot of us as children. It works with a small cylinder punched with tiny holes. I quivered with emotion as I turned the key. This is probably the thing that we just experienced um, last episode. The message gave was simple. He was telling me he loved me very, very much. Oh, maybe not. Uh, Gertrude gave me a different tiny cylinder for today's toy. Hans is truly incredible. He has found a means of communicating between us and us alone in total secret. Giving those voice cylinders. That's kind of cool. February 27th. My days are spent eagerly awaiting Hans' messages. He has now resolved to run away. He is preparing his escape like if it was a game. March 6th. Gertrude has returned and she is beside herself. Hans has disappeared. Father is not even deemed to return to the workshop where he locked up his son, nor find out how he managed to escape. He just gave me a black look as if he knew we were up to something behind his back. March 7th. It's beginning to dawn on me that Hans is gone. I miss him so much. Lord, please protect my little brother and watch over him for me. March 11th. With Hans gone, father now locks himself away night and day at the factory. The house is so gloomy now. March 12th. The morning I, this morning I caught father in the drawing room installing a coffin on a trestle. The sight of it made my blood freeze. What on earth is he up to? My questions meet only with stony silence and a permanent black countenance. March 13th. Behind closed curtains, the drawing room with the coffin, surrounded by huge candles, has become a veritable funeral chamber. March 14th. This is ghastly. I have just understood what Father is up to. This morning, the priest came to pray before the coffin, and I finally caught on. Father is in mourning for the death of Hans. Father made the priest believe that his son was dead. How could he do such a thing? March 16th. In the madness occasioned by his grief, my father grows ever more cold and calculating. He contacted his old friend, Dr. Schmoll, who duly drew up a bona fide death certificate without even seeing the body. I dare not imagine what yarn he spun. March 17th. Hans' funeral will be officially held next Sunday. Father strictly forbade me to attend. 
This sordid masquerade makes me feel ill, but I cannot denounce the subterfuge or else I will display my father's mental instability to the world. The shame would kill him, that much is certain. March 23rd. 23rd. <laughs> I have to get away. All of these are like 23rds. They didn't really change any of that. Oh well. I have to get away, far, far away. And then April 23rd, the last entry in the journal. No, I will not leave. I have thought long and hard. My life is here, next to my father. He needs me too much now. The factory needs me because father is incapable of running it now. Besides, I can only find peace of mind among Hans' robots. And how shall I know when he has sent me new ones if I am not at home to receive them? No, I shall not leave. My destiny is to remain here and keep watch. That's interesting. That's a very drastic change in the course of one month. Uh, but I'm glad that we read this. I know that was quite long, actually. But that filled in a ton of backstory as to what happened. That still didn't help us with the robots, though. And I don't know what this is, but from time to time, this little uh, FPS counter and stuff comes up. I'll get rid of that for the next episode. Let's just check here. So the fax is no. The Val Delen Gazette. There's nothing that's going to be in there. Maybe it's in the advertising brochure. Um, Automaton, two distinguishing features, high precision mechanisms, and characteristic Vorbler wind-up key. Standard toys are constructed from local wood, while the most sophisticated ones use precious resources. So maybe, maybe this wood piece will match something. It's like a light brown. Like that, maybe? That does look like it could fit. It looks close. Let's see if this does anything for us. Doesn't look like that works. Uh. Doesn't look like that works. Okay. Doesn't look like that works. Doesn't look like that works. What the hell's going on then? That's really bizarre. Doesn't look like that works. Huh. Doesn't look like that works. Do I have to have this one? That's really bizarre. Doesn't look like that works. Oh, you know what? I bet. You know what it is? Is we had we had gotten that barrel of whatever to go into the area underneath here, but there is a, like a forklift type thing that we found earlier that's not actually activated yet. So we probably have to activate that forklift and then try this. Let's see. Ah, see, there it is. Very cool. I forgot about this thing. It's cool how those things go back to the exact same spot every time. So that might make a big difference because we had run into that outside and we, we saw that it sent a barrel indoors. And uh, I kind of thought it would just do it automatically, but I guess not. Let's try this again. I mean, that's... 
in that brochure is the only piece of wood anything that we've seen, so it only makes sense to try and match that up, I think. But maybe it'll be wrong, who knows. Is this the one? I think, I think that's it. Boom! Cool. So these are some legs for Oscar. We'll go down there, grab them, and give them to him. And then he wanted to run like a... Uh, he was made to run some train, so I imagine that he is going to take us somewhere. To where? Who knows? But perhaps, since we, we know that Anna was talking to Hans about it, perhaps it'll take... It was supposed to take... Anna to him. It's very possible. Oh wait, let's go grab the let's go grab the legs first. There we go. Now Oscar was underneath the stairs as well. See how that music's kicking in again? I really think that means, like, you're on the right track. <laughs> That's the impression I get. Otherwise, you just kind of get the dull roar of whatever's happening around you. Here are your feet, Oscar. I hope they fit. Kate Walker. I see you managed to produce two XZ2005 underscore B models. Right on. Now, how this thing is, like, basically alive, I have no idea. Like, they said they have, like, a soul chamber or something. There are a lot of things that we obviously don't know just yet. Allow me to express a real feeling of joy, Kate Walker. They really suit you. Comfy? Very. You are very kind, Kate Walker. I am sorry to have to leave you. Where are you going? I must find my train. Its departure is imminent. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. Well. That doesn't leave us with a lot of choices, so I imagine we're just gonna go and, uh, go to the train? Like, I can't think of anywhere else in the area that we haven't been yet. We've been to the train, but, like, nothing was happening there. But now if he's there, maybe some things will be happening. So let's take a look-see, shall we? I still don't know why I got this water thing going. That's one thing that's confusing me. It may have, maybe it's creating some power or something and I just kind of did it by accident, but I'll never know. All right, tell you what, we're gonna take a little break and then when we come back, we'll go to the train section and see if Oscar uh, can maybe take us somewhere. Cause it seems like we've been everywhere in, in Valadolin for now anyways. Uh, I could maybe go back to the hotel and see if anything's going on there, but uh, I will try the train first. Okay, thanks guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.